Hi everyone, welcome to the Artist Diaries, Digging Deep Beyond the Palette by Masterius. I'm Julie DeBoer, your host. You might have been expecting Anae Jones. Sorry, it's me this time. Thanks, Anae, for your willingness to host. <laughs> um, you might have heard that we're going to be chatting with Cindy Ravel shortly. I'm very excited to interview her. Uh, I'll intro her in a minute. The intention of the Artist Diaries is to dig deep into stories of artists to find encouragement, commonalities, to share ideas, perspectives, and overall to share openly and vulnerably because that is the spice of life. We are about real people, real relationships, and real connection. If you're checking us out for the first time, we're so glad to have you. We love getting to know each other, so please say hello in the chat. Share your comments, stories, questions, whatever you like throughout the interview, and we'll try to get to them all. If you have questions about Masterius, go to masterius.com or stick around after this event. Mike, our CEO, will pop on to share more about Masterius for those who are interested. Uh, how we help artists work directly with master artists and professional artists for teaching and mentorship, all online from the comfort of your studio and always interactive, relationship-based and live. Our community is one of a kind. Well, I'm so pleased to introduce you to Cindy Ravel. If you haven't met her, um, I'm so glad that you can meet her today because she is a gem. She is a master artist from near Edmonton, Alberta in Western Canada. Cindy's art just makes me smile. She describes her style as whimsical expressionism that is exuberant and vibrantly colorful. I love, <laughs> I love your explanation of your, your description of your work. Cindy's artwork is in magazines and books. She's been shortlisted for a Governor General's Award uh, her work has been on wine bottles, CD covers, billboards, furniture, murals all over North America. And her clients include Disney, The Washington Post, Better Homes and Gardens, and Scholastic. Cindy's award-winning gardens, interiors, and still lifes are represented in galleries across North America. Alongside all things art, one of Cindy's many loves is teaching. She delights in passing on the practice of asking, what if, and fostering the attitude that anything is possible. We're so thrilled she's one of our master mentor artists here at Masteries as well. Welcome, Cindy. Hello there. How are you? <laughs> I'm great, thank you very much. Wonderful. You look so small, but we'll get you on the big screen here shortly. <laughs> um, and as I mentioned, I'm Julie DeBoer. I'm also an artist. Um, I'm one of the founders of Masterius. I'm a M Masterius member and a professional artist mentor here. Um, and uh, I paint these large, whimsical, flowing landscapes, uh, as you can see, and uh, in acrylic. Uh, I do have a few announcements before we dive into the interview. Uh, if you haven't heard, tomorrow we have uh, our next painting challenge with artist Marjorie May Broadhead. And this is a paint along. So we're going to go live together tomorrow at noon. Uh, that's Mountain Standard Time. And we're going to meet Marjorie. She has a floral for us, a sunflower piece that we're going to paint together. And then the following week, we'll take a look at everyone's paintings. So sign up. You can find that at masteries.com under events. And if you uh, haven't already grabbed a free events membership, uh, those are uh, we're giving those away until end of day tomorrow. So grab one. It's a one month events membership for free that gets you into all of these live events, also gets you access to the recording of the events. And at, you'll get access to our online community so you can start to get to know other masteries artists and mentors. So grab one of those while you can. And if you didn't hear the big news, on December 1st, we announced that in January, we're launching courses at Masterius. We are well known for mentorship and now we are doing courses as well. So you can uh, check that out. It's in the main menu at masterius.com. We have a bunch launching in January and more in February. So take a look. Uh, and it's all of our mentors that will be teaching those courses as well. All right, I think that's it for announcements. Thanks for bearing with me. 
Well, Cindy, it's just you and me. Uh, I'm so excited okay. to, to dive in. Um, we, we have uh, an hour. Um, I'd love to start with a, a bit about your journey. I know that you've done, um, you've been an illustrator, you used to paint very realistically, and now you uh, have a very whimsical style. Can you tell us a bit about that journey? Sure. So I started out painting or drawing very realistically. I, I really didn't paint very much. I paint, well, I guess I did paint a little bit. I, I did watercolors, but my, I, I, I did realistic drawings of people out of Vogue magazine. This would have been way back in the 80s. <laughs> and I loved that. Didn't really occur to me that there was something else that I could be doing. Um, until I went to college and I could see, hmm, there really is scope for a lot of variety. And so in my work as an illustrator, um, I was doing these black and white illustrations, genderless, um, featureless for a company that had only a black and white printer. And the reason why they wanted the gender, genderless and featureless was, was just so that it would have a broader appeal to anybody. In my opinion, I thought, well, that's going to have an appeal to absolutely nobody, but hey, I'm not the boss. <laughs> 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 so I, I had to do that. Um, but I thought, how, what will they look like? Like, as you do, to have a completely realistic figure with no face, I thought that is just creepy. Hmm. And I can remember my boss at the time, she, I think this is so long ago, this was in the 80s, so it's hard, hard to quite remember, but I think she suggested Ted, for me to look at Ted Harrison. And so Ted Harrison's work was extremely simplified. His figures are very simplified. And I thought, okay, yeah, that would work. So I was sort of doing a simple, chunky figure um, and I was using scratch board which lent itself very well to that style. And at first they were quite simple and then they became, um, if you've ever seen scratch board or woodcut actually, uh, they looked, I was using scratch board, but they looked more woodcut. And so they were quite chunky with lots of marks and lines and, and energetic um, movement lines in the backgrounds. And as time went by, I kind of morphed away from that. I, I started kind of adding faces and a gender and the company didn't really say anything. So I, I guess that was all right. But it really was the beginning of a very whimsical style, which I had no clue I would ever go in this direction. And so I, as I began freelancing, um, then of course the opportunity for color came along because I was no longer tied to this company's um, lack of color. And so the, the style itself began to morph. The figures got longer and more elongated, but I kind of kept the spaghetti-like arms without elbows and things. And at some point I got interested in acrylics. I was, I started looking at naive and folk art, mm -hmm. which just fascinated me. I just, I loved naive art um, and folk art. And I thought, hmm, I could do, I could see the acrylics in, in that particular way of painting. So then I began exploring acrylics. And I thought, well, this is, this is fun. So then I sort of switched, started doing acrylics instead of the scratch board. Uh, after that, I guess in about 20, 2002, I started taking oil painting. And that was when I got back into realism again. And I really was reignited with my, with this, this love for the old masters and still life. I was just passionate about still life. That was probably my favorite thing to paint. I liked cats, but I, for, at that particular time, still life was my thing. But as, as my history seems to show, I would get tired of things. And I thought, you know, I was getting bored with this very tight realism. And I started doing loose studies to loosen my work up. And I, I fell in love with that. I would, you know, I was a very anal painter. 
Everything needed to be just. So when I thought I was being loose, I thought I was being loose, but I was not being loose. Mm. But the, the 15 minute studies really helped me break free of that. And I'm standing at the easel one day and I thought, I wonder what would happen if I did my illustration style with this really super loose painting that I was discovering. And I, wow, I fell in love. I did a quick 15 minute painting and I thought, okay, that was amazing. <laughs> and so I kept exploring that to see where I could take it. This time I was still doing illustration. I was still doing still lights. But I'm sorry to say still life, but I dropped them like a hot potato. <laughs> and I went straight into the whimsicals and continued exploring the style to see where it would take me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's that such a thrill. Yeah, and I'm, I'm inspired. Um, so how did that impact your collector relationships and gallery relationships? Did you, how did that go down? Oh, what a great question. <laughs> At that time, um, I only had one gallery and she was totally into it. Okay. She said, why not? Her, her attitude was, you should paint whatever you like. Nice. So I did. And, and that, that was fine. But in terms of my collectors that I had begun to gather, they kind of went away. Yeah, so, I bet. Yeah, so anybody that's thinking about making a major leap in style, I would make it gradual unless you have another source of income, which I did. So I really wasn't all that concerned about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you want, you must know that you love something enough to make that kind of change that's going to affect your, your business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's inspiring to hear that you followed your, your joy um, because I know that that's hard to do. I know from experience that it's really easy to get stuck or pigeonholed um, and to break free of that is, is majorly inspiring. So good for you. <laughs> oh, so um, tell me a little bit about um, having a consistent style. Um, what's the benefit of that? Uh, what if, you know, an artist has, you know, paints in three different mediums and has, you know, realistic style, whimsical style? What's, what's the benefit of, of having one consistent style? Well, people get to recognize it. Like, you know, we're not only visual, artists aren't only visual, everybody else is visual as well. And so when they see an, a, something that they like, and they and they see it repeatedly. They can they remember that work. They might forget the artist's name, but they will remember that work. And so, from that perspective, it it is important for galleries. It's important because it's a lot harder to market. Can you just imagine saying when somebody comes in, or you're trying to do a newsletter or something, or explain what somebody does, and it's like, well, they kind of do everything. Right. You know, people want something to to hang their hat on. They need that a visual reference. And our style becomes our brand, just mm -hmm. like the Coca-Cola logo. And people remember that. I mean, but I don't want anyone to feel that they have to be stuck in one particular style. I think, obviously, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I, I feel it is important to branch out. And I did do several different styles while I was illustrating. Um, that didn't hurt me any. I had two styles that were both very strong. They were somewhat related um, in that they were both whimsical. One was acrylic, one was in scratchboard, and they were in two different palettes. Okay. Um, and that worked. That worked out okay. I think it's it's not so easy to do that in the gallery world. And I and if a person is interested in galleries, I would not recommend that. Having said that, I fully intend on someday. Um, probably introducing another style and then they can market me as the artist that does two styles or three styles. Mm -hmm. So I, I think when you get enough of a following that you have more latitude with what you can do. And I, I do recall there is an artist, I can't think of what his name is, but he does lots of different stuff and he does it successfully, but that mm -hmm. is really rare. Okay. 
and I, and I think he was, he's just absolutely mega talented that he is able to do that. I don't think that's for everyone. If, if someone does not yet have a gallery and they're not sure where things are going with them, then I would say explore to your heart's content because for me personally, exploration was the key to a rich artistic life and it brought me unexpected benefits. Mm -hmm. So for me, exploration, doing lots of things was good, but I will say that it is not the easiest road because then you have to deal with, you know, losing a group of collectors and having to start all over. Right. Obviously I like challenges. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it, it can be hard to make doing what you love into what you do for a living. Um, how have you learned to balance um, art as your passion, as you know, part of your life and as your career? I would say um, I probably haven't balanced it all that well. Um, art has really been all consuming. Like I come to the studio first thing in the morning. And I'm here till supper. Wow. Um, and I'm not always painting, but this this room is like my very much my world. Wow. Uh, yeah, I spend well all day in here, and I and also all weekend. <laughs> I wow. have no fun. <laughs> <laughs> so, like seven yeah. days a week here in there. Also, yeah. I, well, I'm, on Mondays I teach. But when I get home from my from teaching, I come to the studio. So I'm not always painting, though. Um, in the mornings, I like to sit in my my thinking chair um, and come up with ideas for art or um, ideas for promotion or learning about Instagram or whatever kind of things that we artists have to learn about as as technology changes. We have to change along with it. Um, maybe I might be reading an art book in here. So, so I try to put in at least half a day of, of good solid work, um, if not more. But I, but I do like to have some time to myself in the morning to think about art. That time in my chair is, is unbelievably productive for me in terms of coming up with ideas. It's actually where I come up with nearly all of my ideas. So for me, it, it might not look like I'm working to, to my husband who walks in, <laughs> but there's a lot going on up here that must be done before I get here. Yeah, I love that. Can I dive into that just for a minute? What, what does it look like when you're in your thinking chair? Are you sketching? Are you journaling? Are you just sitting looking at artwork? Are your eyes All closed? Of them. Are you imagining what's going on? Well, they're not closed. They're definitely open, um, but it, all, of, all of that. For example, I might start journaling about something and then an idea will pop into my head. Down goes the journal and I find a hunk of scrap paper and I quickly write down my ideas. That almost always will lead to a big flood of ideas and I will fill like papers, multiple sheets with a bunch of little thumbnails of ideas. Wow. Um, I might be looking around the studio at art. And that might twig ideas and then I go off onto a, a tangent of, of more idea making. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very, um, it's a very um, rich and creative spot. <laughs> no kidding. You know, I, I've been an artist now for 12 years and I just got a thinking chair like a month ago. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm starting to discover the value of it, um, but you've inspired me further. I need to do more time in my chair, yeah. I think. Yeah, you know, the only, the negative thing about it is that this idea, coming up with ideas and writing about them, and it can, gets a little bit addictive. And then you just want to keep coming up with ideas and it does take away from painting time or promo time or all of the other business things that we have to do. So I'm really quite torn over it because on one hand, I feel it's very important to me as an artist. On the other hand, I mean, I can see the computer out of the corner of my eyes saying, better check your email, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. The easel is right across from my chair. I, I need to get at a painting. So I'm always torn, I'm a push me pull you. I should be there, but I wanna be here. 
Yeah. No, I should be here, but I want to be there. But yeah, <laughs> it's it's really it's quite challenging. So I I this question about balance, I am not balancing it very well. <laughs> I should be well, spending more time with the council. Yeah, well, I think it sounds like you're doing great. But yeah, I know I know the challenge. There's many things as an artist you need to be thinking about as a business person, as a you know authentic, passionate artist. Oh, so much. Yeah. Um, there is a question from the audience. Does Cindy still do illustration in addition to painting and teaching? If so, how do you balance two businesses? I just gave up my agent this year after 22 years. Yeah. Ah! Wow. <laughs> it was so scary. And I just, I've had her, well, for so long. And of course, we built a relationship. But I really wasn't doing that much illustration. I had um, say no to almost all jobs except for one big job that would come in every year. So I do the Lang um, Lang Publishing that has been doing a calendar called Mom's Planet since I think about 2003 or something like that. And so I've been doing it all that time. So that was one job that I wanted to keep doing. Um, so I'm going to keep doing that. But it's only once a year and it, it only takes a few weeks. So it kind of just slides right in, not too badly. And I, I make time for it. But everything else, when jobs come in now, I give them to other illustrators that I know. OK. Um, because it just, it would, at some point, enough is enough. You need, you need to find focus. And I felt that this is more important to me than illustration. Mm. Uh, good for you. Do you ever paint? stuff you don't enjoy or um or do you are you really determined to only paint what you love pretty much only what i enjoy but that doesn't mean i'm not willing to try something different so so one of the galleries that i'm with artem has a, a show every year where they're they ask the clients to submit a photo and then they the, the client chooses an artist to paint it in their style. And I was chosen to paint an old heritage house in a, a kind of like a, a, a humongous yard um, with maybe a few little houses or something in the background. It looked like a gigantic estate, actually. Hmm. And I thought, oh, wow, whatever am I going to do with this? And there was a person in there wearing a black coat and a, and a clear umbrella. And it had lots of very formal shrubbery around it. And I, wow, I thought, I do not know what I'm going to do. But so of course, like you, when you have to do something that's not of your own choosing and you feel the pressure of someone else's wishes, in this case, their client, you immediately go to, how can I make them happy? Mm. Which I know darn well is not gonna result in a good painting at all, not mm. for me. And so I had to say, how can I whimsicalize this as much as possible and not worry about anything else? And when it came to doing the person, I was really nervous. And I thought, obviously, they included the person in there because it probably meant something to them. So I thought I, I needed to include the person. So I ended up doing two paintings, one without, so I could test what I was going to do. And then another painting, much larger, and I included the person. And, and I had to really work hard, actually, at staying true to my own personal vision. But it was a good choice. It turned out good. I was really happy with it. And actually, I liked it so much. I'm, I've done a few more like that since and probably will continue. So that is the benefit of doing something that someone else suggests. You don't know where it will go. But you have to know your own self that, that you can do. If someone asked me today, to do a painting of a high, high rise in a, in a uh, Marvel comic style, I would have to say no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, that's, that's great. Did the, did the client love what you had done with their photo? They did. They bought them both. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. Congrats. Yeah. So um, you know, risk is a good thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely stretches you. You said mm -hmm. that as soon as you think, I hope they like this, you know it's going to be a bad painting. Can you expand mm -hmm. on that? 
Well, because because then I'm thinking more about what their expectations might be versus what mine are. You can't read anybody's mind. You'll go crazy trying. You really only know your mind. And even then that's kind of half-baked, you know? So, <laughs> so I, I, I bet you there's tons of people that are great at doing that. I'm not one of them. I get anal and uptight. I worry that I'm not going to do a good job. Then I second guess everything that I've ever learned. Mm. So for me, it really is best to keep it in my wheelhouse and not, not think about what the other person wants. Mm -hmm. If I was doing, if, if I don't really do commissions because I'm not really, I would fall into that worry mode. Um, but if I were to do a commission, I think I would simply say, I'm, I really have to follow my own vision. And uh, I, I would probably ask for some money, I think up front um, for the time. And I'm, I don't know, actually, I don't know how I would do that because you can't ask for money up front and then not give them the painting if they don't like it. So I mm -hmm. think you'd have to be confident enough to be able to say, if you don't like it, you don't have to pay for it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But it, everybody's different with that. Some people want money up front and I'm not sure how they resolve it. If the client doesn't like it, maybe the, maybe the money up front is how they get paid for at least the work that now they may not be able, may or may not be able to sell. Yeah. I don't know. It's not something I ventured into to yet. And I, I don't know if I will. Yeah. Of course, I, when we come could come along next month and I could change my mind because risk is good, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and it's very much like what you said with the challenge at Artem Gallery. Um, I've done lots of commissions and there is this constant battle between trying to please someone and being authentic and doing it the way that you need to do it. Um, it's tricky, but yeah, I think uh, Naomi made a comment uh, when they know your style and ask you to paint something, I assume they'd want you to use your style. I find commissions stressful due to the fact of pleasing someone else to paint their picture choice, which is, yeah, that's exactly, exactly yeah. right. I used to hate commissions. Now I like them. I don't, I don't do a lot anymore um, because I want to paint what I want to paint, but yeah. They yeah, can be. exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like illustration, you know, I, I would find that mostly people knew what your style was. And so they would not ask you to leave that every now and then I would have someone who couldn't resist fiddling and then it would change totally from the way my style was and then it would be artwork that I would never have shown anyone because mm. I wasn't happy with it yeah but I mean if, if you if you plan your fee structure to be paid for a certain like either in quarterly uh a quarter as you go however you structure that you can always kill the job and say, well, you've got your 25% up front, let's just call this a day. Right, yeah, yeah. I don't know, it's tricky, it's, it's yeah. tricky. It is. Let's segue into fear. Um, I think artists, I've said this a million times, artists are some of the most courageous people uh, and being an artist takes constant courage because you're putting, you know, what's deep within you, emotional, um, you know, stuff that needs to come out of you onto the canvas and you're putting that out there in front of the world to judge and say, mm, I don't like those colors and oh yeah, that's not very good or, 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 or the opposite. Um, we, we're risk takers. Um, can you talk a little bit about fear and how it has informed your journey? Well, I would say I was, I probably always had uh, a level of it. Like when I first decided to quit my job and freelance. I was scared. It's like, well, there goes that income. Mm. You know, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to get lots of more clients. And I kind of eased my way into it. But at some point I had to make the decision. Am I going to let that income go? And so there was a certain amount of fear, but at the same time, there was enough excitement that it kind of squashed it. And I didn't, I didn't really worry about it. It's like, at some point you have to just set that aside and do stuff whether you're scared or not. Like really, I mean, there's lots of things I've taken on that I was scared or nervous about. And I don't know, once you sort of just say, I'll be hell with it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if I'm scared, I'm just gonna do it anyway. Good stuff happens. 
And if, and if you get, there's always going to be the odd failure and it's not going to kill you. <laughs> it, well, it, it'll, it'll always teach you something. Hmm. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, you know, uh, Frank Sinatra's song, My Way, he has a line in there. Whenever there was doubt, I ate it up and spit it out. Ah. I used to have that on my, stuck on a sticky on, on my easel. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, you can have all the fear and you want. You, you just want to chew that up and <laughs> carry yeah. on. Well, and, and in that vein, um, the importance of exploration and failure, um, how, how, can you share an example of how that has benefited you? Um, exploring, failing, and then maybe going a different direction? Um, well, again, you just, you just do it, right? Like you, there's no, really not a lot of point in second guessing oneself. If, if you're compelled to explore something, you should just go ahead and explore it and see what happens. You're either gonna love it or you're not. It's either going to find it, work its way into your work somehow, or it won't. Like you, you've got your artistic instincts to guide you about what feels correct and what does not, right? Um, like I think about when I, when I switched from realism to whimsical, that came about 100% because of exploration, mm. right? If I had to, I wouldn't have done, I don't think I would have, I don't know, maybe someday I would have been sitting out on a lake somewhere fishing and I, and I might have thought to myself, hey, I should uh, paint really loose, whimsical paintings. I don't, would that have happened? I don't, I don't think so. I think we're led in, we're, we're led through other things um mysterious things <laughs> um, <laughs> and we're also led to our own whims and intuition which i also think are <laughs> yeah yeah right and so you kind of just have to go along with it if, if something is giving you serious misgivings um i always write about it to see why something is giving me a misgiving and maybe it's something I shouldn't follow through. Maybe I'll just do it for a little bit and see what I think about it. And it might teach me some interesting little thing that I may not have discovered. But if I'm not feeling a lot of real mojo for it, well, I'm not gonna keep doing it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you don't find out what, what's gonna give you the big wow until you start doing it. Mm -hmm. so you just have to do it. Yeah, that's good. I think I forgot. What the question was. I mean, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Um, how about uh, another topic I love to talk about is success and what does it take to be successful and how do you define success for yourself? Um, yeah. Well, I suppose when I was younger, I would have thought that money was about success. Um, but there was a time when I was making extremely good money in illustration, and I really wasn't all that happy, nor did I feel particularly successful because I was working so many hours. I was just exhausted. Um, the yard looked like hell because I wasn't getting any weeding done, and I, I was never doing anything because I was always working. And so if that's successful, who needs that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so. I mean, it really is it's becoming quite cliche to say that success is what we want it to be, but really, I mean, that's the truth, right? I mean, for some people, success is going to be um, exploring their painting and simply improving without, not, without selling. Maybe they don't want to sell. Maybe they don't want the hassle of that, right? Mm -hmm. they, they might just want to see how far can I take this skill that I am developing and and if they take it to the rep through the rest of their life and it's given them a great deal of pleasure I would say that is about as successful as it gets mm -hmm. for, for me it includes making money because I, I want to make a living at it still um, not only that you know paintings are big and unwieldy and I don't really want them hanging around the studio forever they they have to move so part of it is making money so that I can make an income Part of it is letting the paintings move off and have a new life with somebody else so that I can then be freed up to paint new things. If you've got a really great painting hanging around, you're 
but you can measure yourself um, off of that. Sometimes it's good to keep around for a while because like, I'll have a painting that I really think is good and I will keep it in studio for a while and it will inspire other paintings. But sometimes it can, it, it can get a little bit um, rote um, and you're mm -hmm. doing maybe doing the same thing all the time or, or you're not exploring because you're falling back into this. So that's a good time to send it off to a gallery or whatever you need to, if you're not in galleries, give it away, sell it, whatever you wanna do with it so that there is room for something else. But everyone is different. And for other people, they might find that keeping those, those paintings around are what inspires them. So mm -hmm. my path is not the path, it's just my path. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, my uh, in-laws' house is full of those paintings of mine that I didn't want to see anymore. <laughs> Whenever there's another one, I just send it over. You did a demo with us uh, a few weeks ago, a few months. I don't even remember. Wow. Do, you, do you have that painting handy? I do. Hang yeah. On. Show us what you did with it. All righty. There we go. Oh, awesome. That, awesome. Was, that was quite fun to do. I, I had a good time doing that. But but I was not able to finish it because, you know, too much, too much talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's so many things to talk about in art. I mean, how can one remain silent? Hmm. I don't believe I finished the background, nor did I finish the leaves. And I had a few unresolved things that I didn't really, really like, small compositional things. Um, so I finished the background. I did not like the cat's white part around his neck. It came down low. One of the challenges with whimsical is that things still have to read correctly and be convincing. And mm -hmm. I felt it was not convincing. So I had to fix that. I felt that the cat was a little bit flat. So I, I added more lights to him. Um, there were some issues around the tail where the, the, um, where the leaf lined up with a stripe in a fashion that I felt was awkward. It was a, it was a poor tangent that I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And so I had to do a little bit of carving of the leaf um, in order to solve that problem. So it was a whole bunch, lots of little small fine tuning things. I find that, that as I'm rocketing through a painting, um, I find that the the end actually ends up taking quite a bit more than I thought it would. Um, because I find lots of little things that I don't like, little things that I feel that need to be tweaked. And I wanna be integrating my background and my foreground. So I need to make sure that some of the foreground color is getting into the background. Right. So just lots of tweaking. Yeah. Um, I was at I, the, sorry. Julie, I can't see you anymore. Oh, okay, I'll unspotlight here. <laughs> I can't, talk to, I can't talk to myself. Can you see me now? Yes. Okay, awesome. Sorry to startle you. Okay. Um, I was at the Artem Gallery last week delivering a painting and I saw your two new big ones on the wall. Woohoo! I didn't know you went that big. I didn't either. That was their idea. Was it? Yes. She said, why don't you do some big paintings? I said, how big? She goes, oh, 30 by 60. I'm like, ooh. Yeah, they look fantastic. Very good chat. That's what I mean. You know, um, some people really don't like to take the suggestions of a gallery owner or somebody else, but really, it's not going to kill a person to try it and see what happens. You never know what will happen. I really liked working on those. They were they're quite a challenge compositionally, um, making the design work out. Um, I'm thinking what would I put in all of that long, long, long space, but that challenge was very, very good for me. I'm really glad she suggested and I'm glad I did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was fun. Good for you. Did you make any uh, adjustments to accommodate a larger size? Did you um, like reduce your color palette or did you do anything different? Um, not on purpose to, to suit the, 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 the painting size, but Doug Swinton had given me um, a tube of maroon perline. 
<laughs> which I thought, hey, I should try a color that I've never used before on an enormous painting. And see what happens. <laughs> so, masochist there. <laughs> well, it turned out beautifully. Uh, will you do more large paintings? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I know the one behind you is also large, so it's not like you oh. only do small pieces. Yeah, but. that but that one's only 36 inches wide, so 60 was quite a leap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is a great size. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your process uh, and where you get your inspiration from? Um, you know, past experiences and, and whatnot, research? Well, I would like to come up with something really um, fantastic <laughs> and earth shattering. Or really, I'm actually really just inspired by very simple things. Um, like something that comes up repeatedly for me is that is the color of aspen trunks in the rain. They mm -hmm. take on this really interesting green, and I I do try to. I, that green has inspired me. It's not a, it's kind of a slightly dirty green. Um, so that sort of works its way into my work. Obviously cats inspire me. Yep. <laughs> I think lots of those. Um, yep. uh, and I would like to say for, that there is some majestic reason behind that, but really I, they're just beautiful creatures to me. Um, I like how, <clears throat> I love dogs. Um, I haven't seen dogs in your work though. Oh, I've, oh. I've, done, I've done a few, not, not very many. I've okay. done a few Dalmatians. Oh, okay. Dogs must have spots. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like cats' solitary nature mixed with their lovey-dovey nature, mixed with their, they can be so sweet, and, and, but at the same time, they're unbelievably wild with their own little minds. Mm -hmm. um, they're quite interesting creatures. So I wouldn't say that I'm necessarily trying to put that on the canvas because really what ends up happening on the canvas, my paintings are very much about um, unseen mysteries, we could say. Hmm. I like the idea of connection, right? How there's this great, the, the world as I understand it is, and the universe and everything is made of energy, little, Teensy weensy teensy little bits of energy. We're just this, we're just this great big energetic soup. So I kind of like that we're all quite connected. And so I, but yet we're all different. We're the same, but we're different. Mm. We're the same elementally, but we're different on the outside. And so I, I like the idea of getting that idea across in my painting somehow, this communication and this energy. So the brushwork is part of what tries to get across the idea of energy. Um, but the but the animals, the birds and the cats, I return to that theme over and over. I love them looking at one another and mm -hmm. and communicating with one another. And it could so an observer can look at it and take it in a serious way. Someone else might take it in a fun way, but there's always a, a communication. And I like to sort of arrange the flowers so that they too are communicating with one another. It's almost like the flowers are giving a little nod to each other of recognition. Mm. So, so there are sort of like underlying meanings. I'm really interested in symbolism, which I think I'm going to, is there, but I think I might work with it at some point in a more overt way. For now, that's the extent of my symbolism, but it's something I'm interested in, in exploring further. Okay. So as for the process you're asking about the process, um, it starts in the chair with my thumbnail sketches. I come to the easel and I don't really have any examples hanging around. Um, I draw them, I just start drawing them using oil paint, thinned oil paint. And, and once I have a composition that I'm really happy with, then I start painting. And often I kind of change my mind as I go or I don't, Unlike what I tell my students, I always tell my students that they should have a good solid plan, <laughs> but I don't go in with a very solid plan because I have found that when I do not have one, interesting things happen, generally mistakes that I then have to work out. But in working out the mistakes, I almost always discover something new to me that I might want to incorporate another time. 
So I kind of like to take that chance of seeing what will happen. Some dogs have happened, <laughs> not good paintings. Um, but for the most part, something good comes of it. So that, that's a valuable method of working for me. Mm -hmm. um, I did not do that for the big paintings. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I had a bit better. I had a bit better plan in mind. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, a plan is is always a good thing. But I do like. I mean, you're you're a master level artist, so it doesn't surprise me that you can. You don't always need to have a really clear plan going into it because um, you know how to work through your mistakes and and make the best of them. Whereas um, I might totally destroy a painting. I have to have a still a fairly solid plan for my work too. But you work differently though, like with glazing. I it's pretty hard to win glazing. That really <laughs> I think does need to be planned more. Whereas mm -hmm. I can if my painting is still wet, I can scrape off an entire I can scrape off a cat's head if I must. Okay. So, yeah. so it's easier for me. Yeah, you've got different challenges than I do. Mm -hmm. Right? Glazing is a different critter. Yeah, good point. So you have what I think is the most luscious brushwork I've ever seen. Um, and I mean, I get to look at your artwork online, but I also get to see it in person. And it is magnetic. Um, it just draws you right in like you want to touch it, but then you don't touch it because you're in a gallery. But <laughs> frowned upon. Um, where did that come from? You mentioned just earlier a bit about energy, um, but can, yeah, can you tell me a little bit about how you landed with such great brushwork? Well, you know, it's very interesting. Well, there's two parts to this story. I was taking a class from this, this old Chinese guy for probably about seven years who didn't speak English. Huh. Um, he was awesome. I loved him. Um, he, you, you would consider him a classical realist. He, he painted quite loosely. I, at the time, painted very anally. Um, everything was really quite tight. Um, but I was learning to paint loosely from him, but, but really struggling uh, with it. And his daughter, Hao, said to me one day, she said, this is you. This is your style, like this tight way of painting. This is you. Why are you trying to change it? Mm -hmm. I said, how? Oh, it isn't me. It looks like me because it's all I can do. But mm -hmm. there is a loose woman that wants out and I'm <laughs> getting out. <laughs> oh, so, that looks perfect. <laughs> two There's of a my loose friends and I go to it. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Right down. <laughs> you can use that. <laughs> There's a loose woman inside of you trying to get out. Oh, <laughs> right. that's great. So two friends of, of mine and I, we go to a Doug Swinton workshop one day. And it was just, just the three of us. Just had a, it was a little, it was a quickie before a Neil Patterson demo. And so Doug decides, he's a, I, I, I'm certain Doug likes torturing me. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. Because he, he would have the class doing one thing and he would give me something different. Ah. But he was always, he really liked to push me and see where I would go. So in this particular class, he decided that we were going to do a fast, fast painting. I'm like, oh, wow. He really does hate me. <laughs> <laughs> so we did them. I think it was a 20, it was either 20 minutes or half an hour. I really can't remember now. And, but it was certainly interesting and I was intrigued. And so we go to the Neil Patterson demo. And at the very end, one artist said, Neil, if there's one piece of advice you could give us, what would that be? And he said, paint a 15 minute, I think it was a 15 minute study every day. Might have been a fast study. I can't remember exactly, but somehow I got out of it that, that painting a 15 minute study. But, All right, I'm going to do that. So every day for over a month, I did a 15 minute study. And the first one was ugly as anything. It was horrifying. I can't even believe that I could look at that thing and, and, and say to myself, you should do this again. <laughs> <laughs> but really, that was where I wanted out. And I really felt that that was my path to it. I just, I had the feeling 
his spidey senses were on the alert that that was the way for me to do it and and it worked it it got my brush strokes uh really loose. okay so for everybody that wants to loosen up if you're not going to use a lot of time don't waste your time or a lot of paint don't waste your time the paintings will be skimpy and you will not achieve the looseness that you're wanting and you will struggle and you won't know why. Mm. You want to slop the paint on like a hog. I mean, <laughs> glop it on. You should have so much paint on your brush that you feel sick at how much money you're spending. <laughs> slop the paint on and because you're only doing it in 15 minutes. And I would do something simple like one thing, one little thing. And, and you make a rule for yourself. You're going to cover it. You're going to do a small painting, six by six or six by eight, something like that, of one thing. You're going to set it up properly so that it's got really nice light, light, nice, nice dark, nice light, which makes it easier to paint than when you've got something all evenly lit because then there's no dimension. Mm. Um, and you're going to get your palette set up ahead of time with tons and tons and tons of paint. And you're going to set your timer for 15 minutes and you are going to slop like a hog. And what's going to happen is because you're going so fast and you've got so much paint on your brush, mixing and mingling is going to accidentally happen. Mm -hmm. And there will be a great deal of ugliness, but eventually it will get better and you will make interesting discoveries. You don't have time to fix anything, which would be what I would have done in the past. Oh, oh my goodness, I must fix that. That's not right. There's no time for that. At the end of your painting, assess it. What did I do well? What did I not do well? Don't assess it for prettiness because that's not really going to happen. But you're going to ask yourself, did I use lots of paint? Um, did I get all scared and leave a white naked outline, outline around my apple? Or did I actually touch the edges? And I, because looseness is partly about the intermingling of edges, mm -hmm. right? Not painting around something mm -hmm. um yeah that was magic for me and that and that is that is when then uh it was through that exploration of trying to loosen up which is when the, the whimsical stuff came along just absolute magic yeah fantastic now this is i think the third time i have heard you say this 15 minute study piece and every time i yeah. say yeah i'm gonna start doing that and i have <laughs> And it, yes, indeed. <laughs> oh. it's, it's a hard I get it, Julie, because you're busy and I know everybody else is busy. And it is a little bit of a commitment because even though the painting itself only takes 50 minutes, you have to set the thing up. You have to right. set up the light. So like it does, it probably takes a good half an hour. Mm -hmm. So I do understand people's resistance a little. Oh, I just see Leslie Starr says she's done that. And she, she yeah. yeah, it worked great for her. Yay! I'm glad you said that, Leslie. <laughs> yeah, and how big of a canvas are we talking in 15 minutes? Well, for me, uh, I'm really not the most, I'm not a speedy Gonzalez. So for me, I it was important to keep it small. So six by six, six by eight. I think five by seven is too small. Um, okay. I used a, fairly, used a fairly big brush. Like even on a six by six, like don't use some wienery little brush like that. Like, you know, make sure you've got a good size brush. Okay. Nice. Um, well, we are coming down to the last five minutes. And before I ask you the last question of the day, uh, I want to remind folks that um, Mike is going to pop on at the top of the hour uh, when I leave, when Cindy and I leave, and he's going to share a bit about Masterius. If you are new and you're curious how to work with someone like Cindy um, and all the cool stuff we're doing together at Masterius, and we also have that painting uh, challenge tomorrow. Don't forget about and grab the one month free events membership uh, that ends tomorrow as well. All right, Cindy, what I always ask and what, um, oh, was it Neil Patterson? I forget who you, who you quoted before. The, the best question is what advice would you give to um, aspiring and emerging artists that you wish you knew when you were an aspiring or an emerging artist? Um, learn to draw. Hmm. I can remember in college, our teachers saying to us to carry a sketchbook everywhere we went and uh, being youthful and thinking that I knew everything and, and, and could do a little bit of drawing. I, 
to the beach to go. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> yep. Carry your sketchbook with you. And when you're tempted to pull out your phone, if you're in a restaurant waiting or somewhere waiting, and you're tempted to pull out your phone and, and scroll through Instagram or something, leave it in your purse, pull out your sketchbook instead and draw. Hmm. How does it help? How does it help? It builds your visual storehouse. So even though my paintings are obviously not real, there are certain things I know about just by having drawn them, I understand how things work. I am by no means the best drawer on the face of the earth. I can, I can draw portraits and things and make them look realistic. But um, if you think about like many of the Disney artists and Marvel artists and all of these people, a lot of them, they can do that stuff. They know how to draw. They don't really need a reference anymore. They can draw people and things in the most amazing perspective. Mm. That's not really something I aspire to by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but my years working in realism certainly gave, developed my eye about how things work, which I, I, I don't, I've never found a better way to explain it than that. Okay, if you've painted one really good vase, you know how round things work in perspective. Hmm. right um if you if you've painted well anything anything that you paint informs the other things that you paint you understand how how light and shadow work you begin understanding how perspective works and so for somebody like me or maybe many of the artists out there who aren't doing realism um you i run into situations where i i may have to use perspective sometimes to get across something so knowing how things work keeps me from drawing things that might not look whimsical, but that may instead look awkward and weird. It's a big difference. <laughs> yeah, and, and I want, one thing I love about your artwork is actually how you push perspective, um, that you play with perspective uh, on mm -hmm. purpose. And that's really, really fun. Things don't have to be um, you know, perfect, but you, you break the rules enough that it makes it spectacular um right. it's, and I think that must come out of sort of knowing how to do it right then allows yeah. you to break the rules because it can go haywire in a hurry it can look off in a way that's difficult to describe right right yeah well you nail it I gotta say <laughs> oh, thank you <laughs> yeah, well, and I hear uh, the, the, what you said about drawing often at Mastrius from our mentors, um, that drawing is a great foundation for everything, even abstract art, um, that the, the foundations of good, good um, work never really changes. And uh, yeah, for those who are interested, there is a course coming up with Mark Thompson and Ned Mueller does lots of teaching around drawing as well. <laughs> Plug there. <laughs> Well, thank you, Cindy. This has been absolutely lovely. I love spending time with you. You are so encouraging and full of life and uh, the experience you bring to the table is massive. And so thank you so much for being so generous and sharing that. My pleasure. I love talking about art. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so nice to be able to talk about art with artists. 